let me first tell you just a little bit about Dr. Natalicio. He was named president of the University of Texas El Paso in 1988. Um, she has had quite an accomplished career, served as, or chaired, I should say, the board of the American Council on Education, is a trustee, I believe, with the Rockefeller Foundation. She's had a long and distinguished uh, career with her institution, having served as a vice president for academic affairs, the dean of liberal arts, chair of modern languages, and professor of linguistics. Her sustained commitment to provide all the residents of her region access to outstanding higher education opportunities is really legendary, and it has helped make UTEP a national success story. She is a proud graduate of St. Louis University, I believe with a degree in Spanish, and she earned a master's degree in Portuguese and a doctorate in linguistics from the University of Texas, Austin. In 2013, she received the TIA Cref Theodore Hesburgh Award for Leadership Excellence in Higher Education. We are very fortunate to have Diana Natalicio today, and we welcome her to the stage. Well, hello again, everybody. Buenos dias. I am delighted to be here at uh, St. Louis University again. This is just great to be back on the campus and um, to see how much it's changed. I was thinking about the fact, uh, I need to tell you, I graduated in 1961. Um, that was a long time ago, and um, this area out in front of this building was a street uh, called West Pine, and, and on this street um, was a little company called Mark's uh, Construction, and it's where I worked in the afternoons, just a couple of blocks down. Um, I worked my way through school as a secretary, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, but as I was walking, as I was riding in in the golf cart this morning, I was looking around and thinking, wow, this is, this is really different. But um, Martha took us down memory lane um, a while ago when she was speaking, and I want to do that just a little bit. I'm going to indulge myself just a little bit uh, because I think it helps drive what I believe in today so much, my passion. Um, is my own story. And so I grew up in South St. Louis near Carondelet Park, uh, if you know where that is. And I, um, I grew up in a, in a working class household. My, my parents didn't go to college. And um, I went to a, an excellent elementary school and then went to Cleveland High School, which no longer exists. And Cleveland High School was, I would say, in today's terminology, a low-performing school. It was a low-performing school because it set very low aspirations for the students enrolled. Uh, we were working-class kids for the most part, and they knew it, and so they assumed in 1957, 58, 59, they assumed that the boys would all complete high school and become apprentices in the unions and work for Anheuser-Busch and and McDonald and all the other big companies um, as electricians and plumbers and carpenters and all the rest of it, and that the girls would maybe work for a short time as secretaries or something like that and marry those guys who were going into the unions, and so there was no need really for college preparation. They, they underestimated us totally. And so I finished Cleveland High School and went to work and I became a switchboard operator at a large manufacturing company um, called Nordberg Manufacturing. Um, I was, I sometimes like to say, the Lily Tomlin of Nordberg Manufacturing. I'm always happy when somebody laughs at that because <laughs> if, you talk to, if you talk to students today, they have no idea who Lily Tomlin is but they certainly don't know what a switchboard is. And the notion, the notion that you have to plug phone calls into a box with cables um, when you're talking on your smartphone is, is really pretty hard for people to grasp. But I worked at that job for about a month. I learned how to do everything that that switchboard could do. I learned how to transfer calls and conference calls and connect and disconnect and do everything. And then I, and I was facing that board all day long in this job. 
and I began to realize this can't be my life. I cannot spend the rest of my life looking at this switchboard and connecting these calls. These are nice people, but this is not fun. And I wish I could say that I was prescient enough to know that switchboards were gonna be passe fairly quickly, but it was really the simple fact that I was bored. And I just thought there had to be something else for me. And so I came here to St. Louis University. Why? Because there were two private schools in St. Louis at the time. There were no public universities at the time. One was St. Louis U, the other was Wash U, Washington U. And St. Louis U was closer to my home and public transportation. That's why I said what I said earlier. This was it for me. I couldn't go to Columbia, Missouri to go to the University of Missouri. That was not part of my family's budget. And so I ended up coming to St. Louis University, talking <clears throat> with folks here about what I wanted to do. They asked me where I went to high school. When I told them, they kind of rolled their eyes and said, OK, but you're going to have to work really hard. You're going to have to work hard. And I said, you know, there's one thing my family does. We work hard. And so I came. And the first year I spent on this campus, I was working half time as a secretary. I had those skills. I'm, I'm still really quick on the keyboard. And I worked in the afternoons. I came to classes in the morning. And every night I went home and studied until I dropped. Every weekend I studied until I dropped because I was so lacking in confidence that I could succeed in competition with the boys who were in my class, all my classes, who went to St. Louis University Prep School, right? And those guys had read Dante and all this stuff. I didn't, I had no idea what they were talking about because I just had very, very inadequate preparation in high school. So those years in high school almost doomed me to make a very bad life choice, which was to go for the job and, and that would be it. But something inside just kept telling me. My parents were supportive. They wanted me to go to college. They were proud that I finally decided to do it, but they didn't know how to help me either. And so today, my passion about what I do is driven by what St. Louis University did for me. When I finished the, uh, the bachelor's degree in Spanish. Why Spanish? I have no idea. I loved Spanish. That was it. I didn't have to have a really good reason. I could still work as a secretary. I love Spanish. And I had great Jesuit professors, people who were just so excited about Spanish literature. And they were, they were just wonderful professors. And Father Bannon, who taught Latin American history. And wow, I mean, I was just so energized by all that. When I was a senior, St. Louis University was trying to qualify to have a Phi Beta Kappa chapter. They asked all the graduating seniors who were in the honors program, and by then I was in the honors program. I worked my tail off to get into the honors program. When I, when I graduated, they asked us all to apply for all kinds of scholarships and fellowships. I applied for Woodrow Wilson and NDEA and Fulbright. Anything they asked me to do, I was so grateful. I would have applied for anything. And I got a Fulbright to go to Brazil. I'd never been on an airplane. I'd never been away from home. And I'm going to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, after four years at St. Louis University? Imagine, totally transformed my life. Totally transformed my life. That then opened up the opportunity to go to UT Austin, because I was recruited by the chairman of Spanish and Portuguese in Rio to teach Portuguese. and do a master's degree at UT Austin. And that's how I ended up being a Texan and so on. So my whole life went in a new direction because of the opportunities opened up. That's what we're trying to do today at the University of Texas at El Paso. Same thing, same thing. Same level of lack of confidence on the part of the students, first generation, more than half of our students are first in their families to go to college. As I said earlier, a third of them report a family income of $20,000 a year or less. Most of their parents don't speak English. Many, many families, very low income, no education, coming out of Mexico. 
And so these students are just totally like me, except I was much better off in many ways. My life was kind of a cakewalk, even though I thought I worked really, really hard. And so what we're trying to do then is to create opportunities for them. That takes everybody on the campus. Every single person on the campus is committed to those students, their access, and their success. So access, what does that mean on a campus like ours? Well, a lot of times when people think about access, they think about opening the front door and giving people an opportunity to come in. But it goes way beyond that, as all of you know, way, way beyond that. So we talk about it in terms of access aspirational. First is aspirational access. Well, what does that mean? Well, we draw about 80% of our students from the surrounding region, 80%. About 75% are from the El Paso area, and another 5% come from Mexico every single day, cross the bridge. 1,100 students cross the bridge every day of our 23,000 students. They're Mexican nationals who live in Juarez and commute. Okay, so when I became president in 1988, one of the things that we started to look at was who are our students and where do they come from? Data is absolutely critical. Who are we educating here? Do we know who our students are? And so we began to look at feeder patterns from various high schools. And what did we discover? Well, the more Anglo, non-Hispanic, and more affluent high schools were sending us the majority of our students. The majority were from the more Anglo and more affluent schools. There were high schools in our region that weren't sending us anybody. Now, if you believe that talent is everywhere, that it crosses ethnic and gender and socioeconomic and all these other boundaries, then you have to believe that you're going to have to get opportunities created so that everybody can participate. And to do that, you've got to raise aspirations. Now, if we look at the, let's see if I can make this work here. Okay, let's see. Let me try. Well, I'm not, I'm not getting it, sorry. Just to move to the slide. Okay. Just move to the okay, all right. Get that up. All right, so this is the backdrop. And I want you to think about this just for, for a minute. This shows you 40 years in the United States 40 years of data based on socioeconomic or income quartiles, and this is bachelor's degree attainment. So if you look at the 1970s, you see that 6.6% .6 in the lowest quartile, income quartile, 6% of the students, young people, completed baccalaureate degrees at the same time that 37% roughly of the upper most quartile, income quartile, completed baccalaureate degrees. Fast forward 40 years to the decade of the 2000s, and what do you see? 8.7% in the lowest quartile complete baccalaureate degrees, and 70% in the upper most quartile. Now, if you believe that talent crosses all boundaries, ethnic, gender, socioeconomic, geographic, this is, not, this is not something that any of us can live with. And it's certainly not something that's going to program success for our society. U.S. is not going to be competitive if this is the pattern. And you know what? It's getting worse. In 2012, the numbers are 80% for the uppermost quartile and about 10% for the lowest quartile. So what that says is your zip code is your destiny. We can't 
survive as a society. This is not a sustainable model. The haves and the have-nots, and Doug said it earlier, you know, it's not the difference between private schools and public schools. It's really the difference in our society between haves and have-nots. And this growing divide between haves and have-nots and the talent that's being squandered in that lowest quartile is absolutely inexcusable, unacceptable, and non-sustainable. So we went out to all of these high schools, mostly low-income high schools in our area, and we said to the people in the high school, so why aren't you sending any of your graduates to the university? And they say, well, you know, they're really not college material. That's what they say. You hear that today in inner city schools across this country. Well, you know, they're, they're, they're not really college material. Well, they are college material. We've demonstrated that over and over again. The standardized tests don't predict what they can do. We've talked about the metrics earlier. What predicts is the talent that's there, maybe not yet discovered, and the motivation and grit to get the job done. And we have demonstrated over and over again that our population has enormous resources to offer, talent to share, but we were squandering it. I'm happy to say that we've been able to raise aspirations. We've gone out into the community in large numbers, and student affairs is very much a part of this, very much a part of conversations in the community with parents, with students, with teachers, with counselors, because everybody has to raise the aspirations. You can't have teachers discouraging kids. At my high school, Cleveland High School here, they didn't encourage us at all to go to high school, uh, to go to college, they didn't. And so that's, that's really critical. I'm happy to say that today, our student demographics now mirror the demographics of our region. So if you look over time, 80% of our students are Mexican American, Hispanic, 80%. That looks like El Paso. El Paso is almost exactly the same, and that's the area from which we draw the majority of our students. Our students' income level has over time declined because we are now serving all talent wherever it is in the community. So raising aspirations, raising college preparation, so raising the academic level of the high schools. We do a tremendous amount of work now with dual credit and early college high schools. We're a closed loop. 80% of the students come from area high schools, and we produce most of the teachers. Well, if you're going to blame, you're going to be blaming yourself, right? The finger curves around and comes right back and hits you. And so the result of that is that we've worked really, really hard with our schools in the area. We formed something called the El Paso Collaborative for Academic Excellence. And pre-college preparation now is all about building confidence and the academic skills to succeed. And we've got tremendous partnerships with all of the schools in our region. Most regional universities in most places around the country, and certainly in a state like Texas, draw the vast majority of their students from their, from their same region. And so the result of that is you can build these partnerships with the schools. <clears throat> and student affairs has been a huge part of the answer to this by conducting all kinds of, of orientation sessions for parents, uh, obviously, we have to do FAFSA, we have to do financial literacy, we have to do all kinds of things, and we've worked very hard to engage everybody on the campus um, in that. Now, in addition to aspirational and academic um, uh, access, one of the most important dimensions for us, because of the population we serve, is financial access. And so affordability is a really high value for us. Our tuition and fees are among the lowest in Texas, 
and Texas has fairly low tuition. We are designated as a research university in Texas, and so we have the lowest tuition of any of the research universities, certainly. And in terms of net price, the U.S. Department of Education's calculation, we have the lowest net price of any research university in the country. And that's because we have a combination of low-income students who qualify for financial aid, need-based, but we also have a very aggressive work-study program on the campus, as I mentioned, 2,500 jobs on the campus to help support students, many of them in research labs, and we have uh, a very large number uh, of scholarships. We award about $14 million in scholarship, merit-based scholarships. We've worked hard to raise money because those merit-based scholarships give students, in addition to the financial resources, they give them the confidence and validation that is so important. I didn't know about scholarships when I came to St. Louis University. I didn't even know that there were such things as scholarships. We try very hard to educate students that aspirationally, if you're thinking about coming to UTEP, you need to be aiming toward getting one of these merit-based scholarships because that says you're valid. You're a valid scholar. It's really terrific to know in Texas we have something called the top 10% rule which says that if you are a um, top 10% high school graduate, if you're in the top 10% of your high school class, you can be admitted automatically to any public university in the state. That's by law. And in the El Paso area now, more than two-thirds of the top 10% high school graduates are coming to UTEP, which validates us, which ch changes the image of the university from the point of view um, of the students. So you have aspirational, academic, and financial, and the last is what we call participatory. And that's something that came up in earlier comments when everyone was talking about, you know, we have to know the, the student population. And so one of the things that we discover, of course, is that almost every single student on our campus is employed someplace, part or full time. So if they're gonna be working, isn't it better that they be working on campus? Isn't it better that there be a coherence to their lives? And so rather than rushing off to a job with a boss who has no sensitivity to exam periods or whatever it might be, is far less likely to be supportive of success than working on campus where there's a rhythm and a culture that says, we understand this is finals week, so if you want to work fewer hours or whatever might, and that works. I mean, that works really, really well. So we're constantly trying to create more jobs uh, for our students. So this, this notion of access for us really gets down to what I would call authenticity. Who are we as an institution? And when I first became president, one of the things that I asked the whole team to do, now I'd been at UTEP, I went there in 1971. Some people ask me, how could you have stayed at one institution all that time? And how could you stay as president since 1988, 26 years as president, really? And people ask me, why did you do that? And I say, well, the reason I did it is because this is a place where I can pay back for the opportunities that I had, but also I can feel the impact of my work here in a way that I think few people would ever have an opportunity to do. This is a very special university, isolated on the U.S.-Mexico border, totally geographic, we're as close to Los Angeles as we are to Houston, so Texas is kind of a distant memory, and many days that's a good thing. Um, and so we're, we're just a different kind of place. And so the impact that you feel at this institution is so powerful because you know you're transforming lives every single day, big time, at scale, you know, big life-changing moments. And so one of the things that we tried to do was understand who we were. 
And when we looked at those feeder patterns, for example, we had to ask ourselves, is this really why we're here? Is to educate only a small number of people in certain high schools? And so I think that notion of mission comes only from gathering data and a lot of it about the institution. And then as you go along with your access mission, compiling more data and evaluating constantly what it is that you're trying to do and whether you're making progress toward that and being your own strongest critics because it is absolutely essential that we be honest with ourselves about who we are and whom we serve and how well we serve them. And so data have become extraordinarily important. We have invested a lot of money in our institutional research operation. We have hired excellent people with great skills to be able to help us do the kind of analyses and work with all of the school districts and the community college in El Paso to gather vertically integrated data. We are tracking everything we can think of to ensure that we're not missing anything. This is extremely important in the bigger scheme of things. Our data analysts are among our most valuable assets. You were talking earlier about legal. Um, we've had to increase staff, compliance staff and legal staff, but data staff, really, really critical. And I can't tell you how important it is to force everybody across the campus to work together around data, around data, not just to share opinions, but to, but to look at data. We spend an enormous amount of time doing that. And we try very hard um, not to be harsh with data, but to be brutally honest, because there's no point in fooling yourself about these things, right? In addition to authenticity, one of the most important things I think that we haven't talked about very much uh, yet today is courage. It takes a lot of courage, actually, to dare to be different. We're driven against certain assumptions. We talked about that earlier. We're driven against certain metrics, whether or not they're appropriate. And I talked earlier about graduation rates and how I have to keep beating that drum about how inadequate they are because they keep coming back to us. You have to be confident and courageous to speak honestly with legislators, with regents, with, in our case, system chancellors and vice chancellors. You've got to be courageous to speak up. It's so easy to take the path of least resistance and just not talk about it and try to conduct your business in a way that nobody notices. And when you're 600 miles away from headquarters, you can, you can get by with that once in a while. But the truth is that we not only have a responsibility to our region, but to all of you, to each other in higher ed. And we've got to get voices out there that are going to advocate for the kinds of students that we serve, the low-income students the students who are first in their families to go to college, the students who have schedules that are complicated. And so we do have, for example, our participatory um, access commitment to evening and weekend and short courses and starting different times and places. And we offer off-campus courses and online and every format we can think of to reduce the barriers for students. But you have to be courageous to defend what you do, and data really help you do that. Courage without data is assuming a risk that we can't really afford. You've got you've to have the facts. And so we work tremendously hard on articulating the case for educating as a public good 
the students that we serve at the University of Texas at El Paso. And that requires an honest statement that the current practice of assuming that higher education is a personal benefit rather than a public good, and that's what I hear a lot when I go to the Texas legislature is, well, you know, who's going to benefit are the students, and so they should pay. Well, I, I would argue that everybody who gets a degree benefits me. We're all better off for having them be successful. And so when we look at these demographics and we look at the way in which the university is impacting these students' lives, you can believe that that's a public good. El Paso is a different place as a result of our having created those opportunities. So we're now graduating a far larger number of people who are going into the community and they're becoming engaged citizens and they're, becoming, they're playing different roles and our quality of life is much, much better than it was before. And that's very exciting, very exciting work. But it's not only access we have to talk about because there's another piece to this. We can be as friendly and as flexible and as affordable and all of those things, but if we don't also focus on quality and excellence, then the degree that the students earn doesn't have the value that they have every right to expect. So excellence is another piece of what we've been working very hard on. So we sat down 25 years ago and started talking about how do we build excellence. And research became a key piece of this story. And so we began to build capacity to do more competitive research. We've worked really, really hard on that. Why? because our students deserve an opportunity to be enrolled at an institution where there is active discovery and excitement that goes with research. The faculty who are involved in it, the expectations that are associated with doing that kind of work, the jobs that grants produce on a campus because grant funding does a lot of the funding of the, of the jobs that we have created. And so we've worked really, really hard on building that capacity, used every strategy we can think of. We participated because we're a minority institution. We participated in the programs of some of the federal agencies that, offer, that offered um, infrastructure development programs for research, so National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and others had programs that were designed as stepping stones to competitive research. We took advantage of those. We have worked with corporations that are interested in recruiting our graduates. You may not know we are a science and engineering school. At our core, we were Texas School of Mines, so we're a mining school, and that means we're a STEM school at our, at our core. And so that means that we're an institution that has the capacity right from the get-go to build research and funded research. And so we worked hard on that. We're doing that research not because we want to be high status or we want to we want to uh, brag or or swagger around because you know it's it's good to be a research university, but we're doing it for the young people who are enrolled as undergraduates. It creates a better educational environment for them resources to provide them with quality. And one of the things that's interesting, if you think about this, when we were first designated, we reached a certain dollar level in our research. We were designated by the state as a research university. I was in the grocery store, and as often happens um, since I've been in El Paso for a long time and highly visible, I get hugs in the vegetable department. So um, what happens is people come up and hug me, and I don't necessarily know who they are, but they know who I am. And they're usually grandmothers or aunts or mothers or um, the men don't usually do it, but the, the women do it. And so I get lots of hugs. Um, and one day, uh, shortly after the announcement about our research university, um, a grandmother came up to me and hugged me and told me how proud she was that her grandson 
um, was going to go to UTEP. He was in high school and he was going to go to UTEP and she was proud of that. And she then said to me, you know, it's so wonderful that UTEP is going to be tier one. You know, that's, that's the language that was used about research universities. <laughs> and, and then she said, but when that happens, will my grandson still be able to go to UTEP? Think about what that means. And so I said, absolutely. That's why we want to be tier one. It's for him. She said, how? And I said, well, because it's going to be a better university for your grandson. When he graduates, his diploma is going to be worth more than it will be today. And she said, I see, that's good. That's good. So the point here is that research doesn't have to be a sort of separate compartment at a university that does the serious highfalutin work and doesn't have anything to do with undergraduate students. It has to do with them intimately. It's all about them in our case. That's why we want to do it. And so we've worked hard on that. And now we've managed to get doctoral programs to go with that. And so we have increased the number of doctoral programs from one, which we were told would be the maximum we would ever have. The State Higher Education Coordinating Board told us that. And now we have 20 doctoral programs. And we did that, we did that because we knew we needed doctoral programs in order to do the research enterprise appropriately. You're not going to recruit faculty who are doing highly competitive research if you don't have doctoral students and the whole kind of vertically integrated research infrastructure. And so we've been working on feeding in these doctoral programs. That got started because of a partnership that was accidental. There was a lawsuit in Texas in 1989 and basically it argued that the state of Texas was not investing equitably in higher education and the case in point was the number of doctoral programs in the border region between El Paso and Brownsville the population of which was approximately equal to the population of the Dallas Fort Worth area there was one doctoral program in the entire border region that was ours in geology because of our mining heritage. And there were 342 doctoral programs in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And so the argument, and this was LULAC and MALDEF suing the state of Texas, the argument was that there was an inequitable investment in the Latino or Hispanic population. The minute the lawsuit was filed, we realized this is an opportunity we started submitting proposals for doctoral programs. And guess what? Where there had been a complete barrier before, suddenly we were welcomed. They were approved like that. That's sometimes what it takes. You gotta be alert and you gotta be a little bit lucky. And so these doctoral programs have really made a huge difference and enabled us to do things that we could never have done um, otherwise. So the state helped us. Um, almost inadvertently, but um, they did. Um, and what we have accomplished now is to become a research university that is totally committed to the education of the 21st century demographic. The Hispanic tsunami has hit this country. People are finally beginning to realize how powerful it is. And what we're trying to do at UTEP is develop the model that says you can have access and excellence in the same place. You can do research, serious research. We're doing about $80 million in research expenditures now annually. We're getting competitive grants from the federal agencies, but you can do that in a place where everybody said it can't be done. US-Mexico border, El Paso, really? Research, it can be done. It can be done. 
And what's most important about it is it must be done. It is our obligation to our students to be the best UTEP we can be. And that's what we're, we're striving to do. Now, I will leave you with just a little bit of, of reflection on what I think student affairs has contributed in addition to the, the whole engagement in student success. Our campus is a totally different place today than it was in 1971 when I got there, 1988 when I became president. We are a very busy campus with a very engaged student population. What student affairs has helped us understand used to be the notion that these students have to work and like me, they had to leave at noon in order to get to jobs. So the campus was basically a morning commuter campus and that was it. We taught classes in the morning and students went off to work. Today, if you came on our campus, it is a busy campus all day long, every single day, including weekends. We also had the notion that students didn't have time for student organizations and for leadership and for all these kinds of activities that more affluent students study abroad and all these kinds of things. We have developed, thanks to the knowledge of people in student affairs, with the students that they work with on a daily basis, we have now been able to develop study abroad programs that accommodate our students' needs. We have internship programs that are extraordinarily aggressive. We have more than 200 student organizations, all of them active and, and doing a lot of things. It's a totally different place. Why? Because we figured out who our students really are. We judged their limitations. We defined them by their limitations rather than by their potential. And I think back to my own experience at St. Louis University. I didn't belong to a single organization. I commuted to the campus either, well, usually on this Grand Avenue streetcar. And I had no, I had no social contacts, very little. I, I worked my tail off, as I said, trying to study and compete because I wanted to make sure I didn't fail. I was so lacking in confidence. I didn't have time for anything. That was a mistake. I tell students that all the time. That was a mistake. I did have time. I could have figured that out. But somehow, that didn't happen for me. At UTEP, we're going to make sure that students get that well-rounded experience. They shouldn't have to go out into the workplace without the opportunity to have done study abroad, to have done internships, to have done all of those things, even though they have to do it in a slightly different way. We got to figure it out. So those models are going to be extraordinarily valuable. And it's thanks to the people mostly in student affairs, the personnel who have come with their insights and listened carefully to students about what they can and cannot do that we have been able to make the progress that we've made. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. I can't tell you how good it feels to be back at SLU and um, on the campus again and I thank you for the opportunity to share just a little bit about the UTEP story. Thank you.